which shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee, until he have consumed thee from off the land, whither thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwoman, and no man shall buy you. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck, until he have destroyed thee. A burden strap to tie my binds. The fear of waters I have never seen in my dreams. Dressed of courage to face my captors. Give me a rattle to sing my death song. For even if I live, I will taste no more the sweet pumpkin, the roasted corn, and soft beans. I will smell no more the scent of familiar woods and smoked hickory. My greased-up hair will shine no more under the rays of a friendly sun. Give me a rattle to sing my death song, because no one will remember my name over the days to come. Almost like the pieces of a broken puzzle. The history of Native American slavery has, for many years, lied dormant in scattered church records, wills, trade transactions, and footnotes of colonial legislations. This business was initiated by the Spanish just a year after Columbus landed in the Caribbean in 1492. Although it was lost to official versions of history, it was never forgotten by the descendants of the thousands of indigenous men, women, and children that were forcibly made to work for unknown masters in Europe, the Caribbean, and North America. Up until the mid-18th century, when Indian slavery was replaced by the importation of Africans, every colonial power that competed for the supremacy of North America used indigenous slaves for mines, fields, and construction work. This pre-African slavery experienced by the indigenous Americans at the hands of the French, the English, and the Spanish followed the vagaries of political and economic interests at the core of very different colonial strategies. If you want to understand the beginnings of Native American slavery, you have to understand the juxtaposition of the three European colonizing strategies in North America. And they were the fur trade in the Northeast, the plantation system in the South, and the Spanish mission system in Florida. The trade in Indian slaves connected these three colonial strategies. As northern wars for fur hunting territories sent displaced Indian groups to the south, local plantation owners armed them to hunt for slaves amongst the tribes living in the Spanish Florida missions. One of the most poignant examples of the disruption of Indian slavery on native groups uh, can be seen through the Appalachian Indians. When the English colony of Carolina developed in 1670, very shortly afterwards, the Appalachia became a primary target for, the, for Indian slave raids from Carolina. Um, by 1704, the mission was devastated by these slave raids, and many Appalachia were killed. A vast majority of the remaining Appalachia were sold into slavery in Cuba. 
No sign remained of the Appalachians' flourishing culture after the incursions of the English and Indian slave traders. Their temples were burned down, their magnificent council houses were destroyed, and their fields were abandoned. What was once a powerful nation of more than 6,000 people was reduced to a handful of scattered survivors. The trade in slaves proved to be so profitable that Carolina's English and Scottish slavers and their Indian allies pushed themselves deep into Spanish and French territories to hunt for captives. In a letter to Charles Spencer, Earl of Sunderland, written by Thomas Nairn from South Carolina on July 10th, 1708, we learn... Your Lordship may perceive by the map that the garrison of St. Augustine is by this war reduced to the bare walls. Their cattle and Indian towns all consumed either by us in our invasion of that place or by our Indian subjects since who, in quest of booty, are now obliged to go down as far on the point of Florida as the firm land will permit. They have drove the Floridians to the islands of the Cape, have brought in and sold many hundreds of them, and daily reduce these barbarians to a far less number. There is not one Indian town betwixt Charlestown and Mabila Bay, except what are pricked in the map. Only am uncertain of the numbers of the Floridians. Our friends, the Talapuis and the Chickasaw, employ themselves in making slaves of such Indians about the lower parts of the Mississippi, as are now subject to the French. The good prices the English traders give them for slaves encourages them to this trade extremely, and some men think that it will serve to lessen their numbers before the French can arm them, and it is a more effectual way of civilizing and instructing than all the efforts used by the French missionaries. The trade in Indian slaves was a vast enterprise that stretched from as far west as Spanish New Mexico to as far north as the Great Lakes. Virtually every tribe living in this large area was involved in this commerce either as a supplier of captives or as middlemen. The Caddo traded uh, Lipan Apache, but the Caddo don't really seem to keep slaves. They just kind of trade. It's down the line trade, so to speak. After that, uh, you, where you have the first, um, first count of slaves is more people like from lower Louisiana, the Washaw, the Chawashaw, the Chittimacha, people like that that go into Mobile. Uh, by the time they're settled up here and the, the system is well entrenched in the French trading system, the primary source of slaves is coming from the West. Many indigenous nations suffered due to enslavement. On the Atlantic seaboard, entire tribes were sold into slavery to the Caribbean. A compelling example of Indians being sold into slavery in Virginia that's often overlooked is what happened to the Nansatico people in 1704. That's actually the w one instance that we have where a tribe was essentially eliminated as a result of, of a conflict here. And a small party of those Nansatico Indians committed an, a killing of one family, the John Rowley family, but what happened as a result, um, the Nansatico were impugned to give up the killers, and they did that, and the killers were convicted in English court, and they were hanged. But the General Assembly also decided that the entire nation could be retaliated against because of what these men had done. So they actually passed a ruling that enslaved the entire population of the Nansatico, with the exception of children that were under 12, and all of those people were sold into slavery in Antigua in the West Indies. Other than being a convenient source of free labor, the enslavement and deportation of Indians to the Caribbean was part of a systematic plan to eliminate the native presence from the emerging colonies. In the year 1636, as part of that war with the Pequot uh, tribe, the turning point was when over 300 uh, men, women, and children were burned alive in the fort at Mystic, Connecticut. The uh, native people were, that had not been slaughtered uh, were 
put into slavery and uh, either in the other tribes who assisted the English in that war or they were enslaved by the English themselves and sold out of the country in fairly large numbers and they were sent to various uh, places uh, and one of the fav favorite destinations was Bermuda. Indian slaves were shipped from ports such as Mobile and New Orleans. Whilst the English sent them to Barbados, the French sent them to Martinique and Guadeloupe, and the Dutch sent them to their domains in the Antilles. We understand the Middle Passage in, in the sense of Africans coming to the Americas, but few of us understand that there was also a Middle Passage from the Americas to the Bahamas, which were the breaking grounds for the slaves, but also to New England, where the markets were. There were some that were sent back to, to Europe. The very first ones that were sent back to Europe were the, were the property of the king, the queen, and the church. And so, interestingly enough, many of the first Indian slaves were taken back to become, you know, wards of the state and, and, and the property of the people there. Whilst undeniably a minority, dozens, perhaps hundreds of Native Americans crossed the Atlantic, reaching Europe as slaves. A rare proof of this is the case of John Panis, a Native American child whose tombstone is still visible in Kent, England. We know very little about John Panis, apart from the fact that we have his tombstone in a Hayes churchyard. Now in 1754, William Pitt had moved to Hayes and by the end of the decade he was actually virtually in charge of the government at a time when Britain was having various military successes all over the world. John Pallis may have been given as a gift from someone who was pleased with the successes that were being achieved and was brought to England and became a servant in his household or possibly for his children because by 1763 William Pitt had five children. A number of people have been suggested as possibly the people that may have given William Pitt John Panis as a gift, perhaps Benjamin Franklin or possibly General Forbes who captured the fort that has since become known as Pittsburgh or he may be one of the wealthy merchants who had connections with the West Indian plantations, where they had slaves. And one candidate is William Beckford, who became Lord Mayor of London, who was very grateful for Pitt's support for him when there was a question that they might put taxes on sugar. We can only imagine what horrendous journey he might have had. The sea voyage, possibly sea sickness. It's difficult to imagine how he felt when he arrived in a strange country with different customs, different culture, different language, different clothes. He would have felt very strange, I think. We don't really know why he was buried in Hayes Church or indeed how he died. He must have succumbed to some illness or possibly it was winter time, perhaps it was smallpox, or it could have been an epidemic or some European disease he was not used to. Unfortunately, the burial records for that period do not survive. So we can't tell if there was an epidemic in the area. Of the 650 odd burials that took place in Hayes Church in the 18th century, 15 memorial stones survive, and one of those is John Panis's so he must have been regarded with some consideration to actually have had a headstone erected for him. Between 1650 and the beginnings of the 18th century, as many as 50,000 Indian slaves had been sold by the English alone to their colonial outposts in the Caribbean. But these numbers are incomplete because many transactions were unrecorded due to the heavy taxation put on slave cargoes. What is more, the fact that slave records almost exclusively mention European names makes it difficult to establish the ethnicity of the people traded. 
for the most part, the, the greatest source of information comes from the Catholic Church records. And they very rarely have even ethnicity, much less a uh, prior name. Uh, the names they, they take are Catholic names. So you have Mary Ann and Marie Therese and, you know, Jean de la Grande Terre and, and whomever. Clearly there are records that establish that Indians were enslaved as, as early as the, the first half of the 17th century, quite more frequently in the second half of the 17th century. It seems to have died out as a practice by the 18th century, mostly because there were other African, there were African Americans that were available for slavery or for servitude, involuntary servitude, if you will, and they were more readily available. English soon found that Native people didn't make good slaves. First of all, here in the, our own territory, if we were made slaves, we had the recourse of running away to our communities, which frequently happened, or to other communities that would give us shelter. Such was the trouble Indians caused that even colonial outposts such as Barbados called for an end to the deportation of Indians from North America. In 1676, Barbados issued an act that prohibited the importation of Indian slaves. This act is passed to prevent the bringing of Indian slaves and as well as to send away and transport those already brought to this island from New England and the adjacent colonies, being thought a people of too subtle, bloody and dangerous inclination to be and remain here. As tribe numbers were depleted due to wars and deportations, European colonial powers looked to Africa for labor. When Africans were brought in, the Africans were often brought into this community and the Native American women married these Africans. So what happened was you began to have a lot of intermarriage and the whole language of mestizo, mulatto, Melungian, all of the M words began to come around. As history brought together Indians, Africans, and Europeans, former names were replaced by new ones that gradually left behind a past encoded in elder stories to make room for novel identities. Mixed race offspring soon became people of color, and Indians gradually disappeared from the records of history. The English found what they could not accomplish with the torch and the gun. Uh, they could accomplish with the stroke of the pen. So that's why they mislabeled our people racially in the records uh, uh, more and more as time went on until eventually there was no Indian presence in the records. There was never that designation. You were identified as mulatto, uh, musty, or any of those other terms rather than uh, Indian. Such was the effort to erase Indians from history that up until the early 20th century, scientists of academic institutions deliberately altered census records. In Virginia, there was a leader of the eugenics movement, a man by the name of Dr. Walter Plecker. He changed records of Virginia Indians that were born and recorded as Indian people to say that they were colored. He did this on birth certificates, marriage certificates, on death certificates, on any legal records that he could get his hands on. So since he physically destroyed or changed records of so many Virginia Indians, he essentially committed an act of bureaucratic genocide on the Virginia Indians. I can't see um, a, a more obvious event than what happened in the 20th century in terms of Virginia Indians being written out of history. Sometimes it got to the point where you were even afraid to say that you were Indian and you told your children not to because it was safer. And so there were just all these different ways of erasing Native people as well as African American people from the cultural landscapes. At one point in time, 
it was it was a bad thing to even say you were Native American. Some people had to lie on their birth certificates and state that they were either black or that they were white. So that definitely had an effect on Native American people. Native people have become the invisible minority here, particularly in the Northeast. The census takers, who were generally white males, made their decision about who was Indian and who was not Indian. And if you did not look Indian, then you didn't get on the census as being Indian. And so those records, whether it was talking about slavery, whether it was talking about indentured servants, you know, it's like putting a 50 million piece puzzle together. They took parts of us and cut them up and threw them to the winds. They made lies we would believe. We look for the parts to put ourselves back together, to put the earth back together. It is broken. We look for truth to put us all together again. There is a piece here, a part there. We scavenge and collect. Some pieces are lost. We will find them. Some parts are found, and we do not see them yet. We gather the pieces and bring them together. We bring them together. We make the truth about ourselves. We make the truth. <laughs>